Good morning. I'm glad to be here in Paris. Let me begin by expressing my thanks to President Macron, Finance Minister Le Maire, and the French delegation for hosting this summit. We meet at a moment of tremendous promise and challenge. In recent decades, developing countries have seen broad economic progress. But over the past few years, that progress has stagnated. Since 2020, the world has endured a series of shocks. We have seen a once in a century pandemic and the largest land war in Europe since World War II, occurring against the backdrop of increasingly frequent and severe climate disasters. These recent shocks have led to millions of lives lost and livelihoods eroded. Further, they threaten to deepen economic divergence between advanced and developing economies. Advanced economies have generally had fiscal space and resources to support their economies and protect their people from the economic impact of these shocks. In contrast, low-income countries are under significantly greater fiscal strain. They're projected to sustain the largest output loss of all economies in the medium term. The situation means that more people are at risk of being thrown into poverty and health and educational outcomes may further stall or reverse. At this critical moment, President Biden has directed his administration to deliver on a comprehensive approach to support our developing country partners. This approach recognizes that economic development is not only transformative for the low in, low, lower income countries that are growing, global development is in the national interest of all countries, including the United States. In the modern world, prosperity at home depends on prosperity abroad. Our development work helps mitigate risks to our own economic outlooks, and it helps drive our own economic growth by expanding global demand for our products and services. Simply put, our fates are interlinked. The United States' approach to development is one of equal partnership. We are invested in the success of all developing countries at this summit. We committed to listening to the diverse needs and concerns of all nations, and we are here for the long haul. That's why we make sure that economic assistance is effective, accountable, and sustainable, and reaches the communities it's intended to help. Importantly, the U.S. is deploying a wide-ranging set of tools to assist our partners. Our strategy mobilizes a broad suite of support from supporting macroeconomic stability to mobilizing development financing to providing technical assistance. We're also working tirelessly to create a more resilient and thriving global economy which benefits all countries. Ahead of the summit, I'd like to share three priorities that the United States is focused on. First, evolving the multilateral development banks and expanding quality development financing. Second, promoting macroeconomic stability and debt sustainability. And third, mobilizing public and private capital toward major challenges. We know change won't come overnight, but our steady work will continue to improve the lives of people around the world, and we hope this summit can serve as a key moment to spur more progress. First, we look forward to working with a growing number of partners to increase the effectiveness of development finance. In an interconnected world, the poorest and most vulnerable are often disproportionately harmed by global challenges like climate change, pandemics, and fragility and conflict. Any 21st century development strategy requires us to address these challenges with the scale and urgency they require. 
That's why the United States has led a coalition of shareholders to evolve and invigorate the multilateral development banks. Our aim is to better combat these transboundary challenges in service of our poverty reduction and development goals. We've already achieved significant change in the eight months since I called for the evolution of these banks. We've made initial updates to the mission and operating model of the World Bank. And we've made preliminary reforms to the World Bank's balance sheet, which will unlock as much as $50 billion in lending capacity over the next decade. As part of our agenda, the MDBs as a system could unlock $200 billion in new lending capacity over the same time frame through balance sheet measures that are either already under implementation or being deliberated. This financing can be used to reduce poverty, combat climate change, and advance other priorities. And that is a big achievement in and of itself. In addition to our existing commitments, the United States is exploring ways to deliver new concessional World Bank financing. We strongly believe that our evolution initiative must benefit all borrowing countries. This new financing would incentivize action on global challenges and enhance support for low-income countries. This includes contributions for crisis support in IDA recipient countries. We invite other World Bank shareholders to join us in this effort in the lead up to the September G20 Leaders Summit. Over the next two days, I also look forward to mobilizing additional support for the Evolution Initiative. As a next step, we would like the World Bank to develop a framework and principles for the targeted use of concessional resources so that financing to address global challenges is deployed to where it has the highest impact. We believe the bank should also develop a mechanism to allocate additional resources to countries seeking financing to tackle global challenges. We'd also like to see the World Bank offer borrowers the option to add climate resilient debt clauses to their loan agreements. These clauses will help ease pressures on countries if a natural disaster strikes. And lastly, we must make sure that the development banks and specialized trust funds work together as a system. This is particularly important in optimizing the many funds that constitute our climate finance architecture. We're taking a staged implementation approach to this initiative. So we expect additional reforms to be implemented on a rolling basis. I'm already working to sustain momentum for this initiative with a new World Bank president, Ajay Banga. He's the right leader for this moment. Now, second, we're working with our partners to strengthen macroeconomic stability. While there's no one formula for development, we know that no country can develop without a strong macroeconomic foundation. The IMF plays an important role in this effort. It provides countries with sound policy advice on macroeconomic reforms that should accompany greater financing. Recent innovations like the Resilience and Sustainability Trust and the Food Shock Window demonstrate the IMF's agility and its effort to make sure that the fund can meet countries' needs while bringing its crucial macroeconomic policy support. I see great urgency in bringing the IMF's concessional window, the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, to a more financially sustainable footing. This is critical to make sure lower income countries have adequate resources at the fund. A key pillar of economic stability is debt sustainability. During my trip to Zambia earlier this year, I discussed how the weight of default and a stalled debt restructuring process can bring suffering to ordinary families 
and hold back the private investment that's needed to jumpstart the economy. Let me be clear, delaying debt treatment hurts both creditors and debtors. It simply worsens the economic fundamentals and increases the amount of debt relief that borrowers will, will eventually need. The international community must come together to support countries that are currently in crisis. And this has been a top priority for me. I've pushed on this issue both in public and in private. At this summit, the United States will continue to push for the full and speedy participation of all bilateral creditors in debt negotiations. I'm encouraged by progress on Zambia, and I hope debt treatment can move forward soon. Other urgent pending cases must also move forward quickly. For example, that I, I believe that all creditors for, for Ghana and Sri Lanka need to provide timely debt treatment in line with their financing assurances. More broadly, we will also redouble our commitment to improve the multilateral debt restructuring process. This includes our work through the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable. Many creditors and debtors have been calling for more clarity on the common framework and the debt restructuring process more generally. I believe that the publication of a guide for borrowers would be a productive first step. It would help address concerns about vagueness and uncertainty around the process. Third, we're targeting additional financing to specific challenges with the greatest need and impact. We've made significant progress across areas like public health, food security, climate change, and infrastructure. And we intend to do more. For example, the United States has contributed almost half a billion dollars to the pandemic fund to strengthen our global health architecture. And since last year, we've committed nearly $13.5 billion in humanitarian and development assistance to address the global food security crisis, along with other initiatives like our strategic partnership with the African Union on food security. Given the massive scale of our challenges, mobilizing private capital is integral to fully delivering solutions. That's why we've leveraged the power of the private sector in a wide range of areas. Take climate. Last year, we launched a landmark Just Energy Transition partnership between Indonesia and a group co-led by the United States. This partnership will mobilize an historic initial $20 billion in financing to support ambitious new targets in Indonesia's transition. And half of that $20 billion is coming from private sources. We're also negotiating the terms of a second concessional loan of, of more than $500 million to the Clean Technology Fund. This program mobilizes an average of over $3 in private co-finance for every dollar invested. On infrastructure, the G7 is channeling $600 billion into high quality investments over the next few years as part of the Partnership for Global Infrastructure and Investment. The United States has pledged to mobilize $200 billion toward PGII and we have achieved 30 billion of that commitment to date. A priority of our effort is to support project preparation. This helps expand the pipeline of bankable projects and it lays the groundwork for private sector investment. To do just that, President Biden has requested $40 million in his fiscal year 2024 budget to expand the work of the Global Infrastructure Facility. We're particularly focused on identifying concrete ways to further scale private capital participation in emerging markets. There's significant opportunity to address information asymmetry through graded data sharing about viable investments. The multilateral development banks also need to build on their trusted relationships 
with governments to help them establish policy and regulatory frameworks that attract private investment. We also need to refine and increase the use of specific instruments like guarantees that can help de-risk projects. I've repeatedly called on the MDBs to massively increase their private capital mobilization rates. And I'm pleased that President Banga is making this a first priority in his leadership of the World Bank. And I know this approach is at the heart of President Goldfein's plan for IDB Invest 2.0. Well, as you can see, we have a productive couple of days ahead of us. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you. Um, Madam Secretary, I wanted to ask you about Zambia. You said you are encouraged by progress and that's in line with a lot of optimism we're hearing. I was just wondering if you could be a bit more specific in terms of your timing expectations. Do you think a deal is imminent? Is it something you expect to see over the coming days? And a bit more broadly, what do you think the implications of such a deal would be for other potential deals and for the common framework more broadly? Thank you. So I, I don't have more specifics I'm afraid to provide to you. All I can really say is that the talks in the Paris um, club have been quite encouraging and we're hopeful for um, really clear and meaningful progress in the near future. So we are very encouraged by um, what we've seen, what we've seen there. And, um, you know, I've been very focused on Zambia. We visited Zambia and were able to see so clearly um, the way in which a failure to restructure debt was holding back investment and um, meaningful economic progress in a country um, that really wished to push ahead with economic reforms. And there are so many other countries where the same problem exists. We've been encouraged by progress on Ghana and Sri Lanka, and we expect and hope to see more countries participate in the common framework and hopefully, if we really do have meaningful progress on Zambia, it will be a good sign for um, future future negotiations for other countries. Next question. Hi. Um, on, the, on this question of multilateral bank development uh, or evolution and the World Bank, I'm curious why of all these steps, a capital increase is not really a part of the conversation or part of what you're pushing for. Um, is that because of the difficulty something like that might face in Congress or just what's the thinking behind not including that in the mix of options? Well, I think our view is that the first thing we need to do is to make these institutions more effective in addressing global challenges. And that means a change in the way they conceive of and conduct their business, a reform of mission, um, operating strategy, incentives, and the like. And even within the capital that the World Bank and the MDBs have, as I mentioned, um, there is clearly potential by following up on some of the CAF recommendations to increase financing capacity. And, um, you know, we have seen um, in the adoption of recommendations um, by the World Bank that have led to, a, will lead to a meaningful increase. As I mentioned, we think for all the MDBs and we want to see reforms, not just at the World Bank, but at the other MDBs as well, we could see unlocking $200 billion additional over a decade. And I think our focus is we're certainly not ruling out at some later stage a capital increase, but I think these banks need to um, function better uh, individually and as a system first, um, expand their mission to address um, the, these global challenges and um, better utilize the capital they have. And then after, if, if all that occurs, 
in this series of rolling um, implementation, we might come back to a capital increase. We're not ruling that out. Hi, um, I had a question on, on the impulsion from the impulsion France wants to give on uh, the idea of a global tax on uh, gas emission, emission from shipping. Uh, the Elysee told us that it was one of their priorities for this summit. Do you see this as well as a priority or not? Thank you. Well, we share France's focus on um, wanting to increase financing for um, mitigation and adaptation to climate change. So we're certainly allied on objectives and um, there are um, a set of uh, suggestions that have been made as to how to pr provide financing for these initiatives. You know, as I mentioned, we've been focused on a, a number, including um, reforms through the MDBs. But certainly this is something that we could, we could consider and we'll look at carefully. Hi. Um, China's Prime Minister is at this summit. You mentioned the problem of the debt burden. China, China is deeply involved in this. I'd like to ask you, um, which role do you expect from China at this uh, summit? What uh, commitments from China you would, from China, sorry, you would like to want? And would you say, like President Biden, that uh, China's president is a dictator? Uh, do you think this would have consequences on the relation between the two countries? Thank you. Well, I th I'm certainly pleased to see China participating in this summit. Um, I believe it's important, as President Biden does, that the world's two largest economies um, are united in uh, working uh, multilaterally and together in addressing global challenges. So I think that's a positive. And uh, certainly we have um, discussed with the Chinese bilaterally and also in multilateral uh, groups like the Global Sovereign Debt Roundtable. Um, we have continually emphasized the importance of restructuring debt for countries, especially low-income countries through the common framework. So, um, you know, we are pleased to see, as I mentioned, some progress on Zambia. Um, China, of course, is, is critical in these negotiations as really the largest um, lender. And so I'm hopeful, as I said, that um, we'll be able to make further progress there. Um, with respect to the comments, um, I think President Biden and I both believe it's critical to maintain communication to manage the U.S.-China relationship, to clear up misperceptions, miscalculations. We need to work together where possible, but we have disagreements and um, we are also forthright in um, recognizing where we do have disagreements. Hello. Could you say a word about um, the rechanneling of IMF SDRs and the U.S.'s contribution to the 100 billion target? Uh, when, how, uh, all the details, please. Thank you. So um, I would emphasize that it is an absolute top priority for the Biden administration and for Treasury in particular to um, gain congressional approval to rechannel um, $21 billion, um, not necessarily in the form of uh, contributing or lending SDR to the IMF, we can lend dollars as well, um, but uh, to some combination of the PRGT and the Resilience and Sustainability Trust. Um, it involves a, a small budgetary um, amount that we've already received funding for. And so it's really a question of gaining Congress's permission to lend these resources to the IMF. And it is um, our top 
uh, priority really with Congress. I testified um, week before last and um, emphasized again in my testimony to House Financial Services how important that is. So this is something we're committed to and we're working very hard at. There's a commitment of $100 billion in total and countries, our partners are looking to the United States to make a contribution. So we, we want to do that and we're hoping to gain congressional authorization for that. Um, can you, uh, I'm Fabrice from Le Figaro, can you tell us uh, a bit more about your bilateral meetings that you're going to have in, in Paris and are you going to talk uh, about Ukraine even though it's not on the summit agenda? Um, well, I have, have a number of bilateral um, meetings scheduled um, with some countries, some countries we meet routinely um, in the G20 context. Um, I prioritized um, here meetings with um, countries that we don't often see in that context. And I would um, indicate, for example, Sri Lanka and Ghana are some meetings that we have scheduled. Um, uh, I also expect to meet with some of our G7 and EU colleagues and um, support for Ukraine and uh, its fight against Russia may come up in those meetings as well. But really our focus here is on uh, the topics uh, that are important to President Macron in the summit and to us. This is um, a real opportunity to advance our work uh, with respect to development financing and global challenges like climate change. And we're excited and committed um, by the opportunity that the summit presents to advance that mission.